All right. Uh, hello, folks. Welcome to Surviving Ransomware and Fear Fatigue, uh, Protecting Your Hybrid Workforce. Uh, I'm your host today, Adam Kujawa. I'm a security evangelist and one of the lab's directors at Malwarebytes. I've got over 16 years of experience fighting malware on the front lines and behind the scenes, working for the military and intelligence agencies, as well as private businesses. Uh, and I've been with Malwarebytes for over 10 years now. So let's get into it. Our focus is, is here is gonna be on how ransomware has remained resilient through the last two years of a pandemic. However, we've also seen quite a bit of law enforcement intervention, arrest and takedowns that has made a dent in the cybercrime world. At the same time, we're seeing plenty of malware groups uh, attempting to spread their wares through exploits and other interesting means. This constant onslaught of attacks, uh, news about attacks and procedures to avoid or recover from attacks is creating what many are calling fear fatigue, which has its own issues when present in the workplace. Uh, finally, we'll provide you with guidance on ransomware recovery and aversion. So sit tight, here we go. Uh, first, we're gonna talk about operational disruption or, or what I like to refer to as a business that, uh, that makes its money from operating like a hospital, manufacturing, things like that. Uh, and if they're, they're unable to, to uh, you know, user systems, then their operations are disrupted and can cost them a lot of money. So first, let's talk about the huge ransomware attacks we've observed this last year in reference to uh, to operational disruption. Um, a lot of these have led to direct uh, law or direct intervention by law enforcement and a lot of you know, government agencies taking ransomware more seriously than they had before. So in May, the United States uh, Colonial Pipeline, which is used to pump fuel across the eastern U.S., uh, was shut down thanks to a ransomware attack by the Dark Side Group. The organization which owns the pipeline paid $4.4 million to get operations back online as fast as possible. Despite this, however, there was still panic buying at fuel stations across the country, uh, causing huge lines, traffic, and overall disruption on a much larger scale than just the pipeline attack. In a fascinating turn of events though, the US government law enforcement agencies were able to recover the majority of that ransom payment by utilizing offensive tactics and gaining access to the attacker backend uh, ransom payment systems. So we'll talk more about dark side and how this happened a little bit, uh, a little bit more. Also in May, the world's largest meat supplier was attacked uh, by the Our Evil ransomware group. Our Evil is notorious for being responsible for many high profile attacks over the years, including the massive Kaseya VSA exploit attack, which resulted in over 1,500 small businesses being infected with Our Evil. The larger fallout from this attack was the scramble by meat buyers uh, to find new sources of goods uh, so their operations were not hurt by the attack. While not a long lasting issue, it did cause shifts in stock prices and caused decreased confidence in our current supply chain, something that we're seeing more and more often uh, thanks to these kind of cyber attacks, and they're gonna have a devastating effect on the real world. So uh, JBS ended up paying $11 million in ransom to get their operations back online. However, they had already recovered most of their systems from backups. Uh, this might have been due to a double extortion tactic by the R Evil group, who we know we do this all the time, uh, demanding payment to not release stolen data. And so maybe that's why we saw the $11 million payment, regardless if, if files were encrypted or not. Uh, let's talk about law enforcement efforts this last year and cybercrime takedowns. So um, starting with our evil, since we already talked about it a lot, uh, after its attack on Kaseya, our evil shut down in July for a few months. The theories are that one of the founders of the group may have been arrested, or maybe they were trying to shake law enforcement heat after this series of massive attacks. Either way, in September, our evil came back online, although that wouldn't last long. In October, law enforcement organizations from multiple countries were able to take down the our evil infrastructure, and we have yet to see it return. You can never be too sure about the disappearance of a cybercrime group. In many cases, they may rebrand and rebrand and try a new name, uh, try again under a new name. This is a, a pretty common thing we see, and, and we'll talk more about how Darkside did this in just a second. Um, so Darkside ransomware was supposedly uh, developed by affiliates 
or a direct affiliate of the R Evil ransomware group. So, uh, you know, there's kind of like a family connection. Uh, but it's likely not run by the same people. When the Colonial Pipeline attack occurred, uh, the attackers scrambled because of the increased law enforcement attention, and they had really good reason uh, to be to be freaked out by this. Uh, law enforcement was able to access backend framework servers from DarkSide, and when they did that, they were able to obtain keys needed to access the crypto wallet the criminals kept the ransom payment in. So um, this is how the feds were able to get back such a large chunk of what Colonial had paid. DarkSide associated uh, folks vanished from the internet, it seemed, in May, uh, but in July, they did come back under the new name. Now they're calling themselves Black Matter. Despite the risk for branding, the new version of DarkSide also shut down operations in November. The pipeline attack was an illuminating experience for both criminals and defenders on what is possible, what needs to be better protected, and what the consequences for attacking critical infrastructure might be. Now, as a step away from uh, ransomware for just a second, if you've been following cybercrime at all over the last few years, you should be familiar with the name Emotet. This family of Trojan malware was the dominant tool used to spread threats like TrickBot and various ransomware families to corporate networks across the world. It primarily utilized social engineering through phishing emails as well as hijacking existing email threads on a victim system and using it to infect more users on the same network. In January, however, a, a massive law enforcement operation disrupted Emotet by arresting multiple affiliates and seizing numerous command and control servers needed to run the malware. In order to completely remove Emotet infections from user systems, uh, German authorities utilized the Emotet update framework to send out a custom modified version of Emotet that automatically installed it, uninstalled itself uh, on a specific day. When infected, systems would reach out to the command and control servers looking for more instructions. Uh, they would receive the modified update. And on April 25th, all updated infections of Emotet were uninstalled. At least those that had gotten the update had continued to reach out. Lots of Emotet infections uh, that were not reaching out or beaking out and just existing on systems still kind of hung around. And that's why you can see on our chart here uh, a slow decline rather than just a, a, a sudden drop in April uh, of Emotet detections. So unfortunately, that's never the end of it. And in fact, in November, we began seeing Emotet infecting systems again. This time, though, it's piggybacking off of an old comrade, TrickBot. So we'll have to see what happens next uh, with these two notorious families. But this did teach us all a lesson. Just because the FBI takes down a server or two doesn't mean that the malware group is dead. We should never count them out. Uh, at least they're, they're, even their legacy can live on, even if one group manages to fall. The lessons they learned, the resources they gathered, you know, the, the people they might have inspired still exist out there. So let's talk real quick about government activities. What has government been doing to, to help with the ransomware stuff? Well, in November, the after the arrest of a Ukrainian man associated with spreading the R evil ransomware, the US Department of Justice put on uh, put out a bounty of $10 million for the name or location of any key R evil leaders and up to $5 million for information R evil affiliates. You know, criminals, they love money. It's usually the reason they do cybercrime. So maybe this bounty idea will work. If you're wondering why a bounty has been put on the head of people whose ransomware groups like R evil is down already, well, while the ransomware is down, the group will likely utilize their skills, like I said, resources, connections, things like that, to create new groups and cause significant damage. So you want to go after the people uh, who have the knowledge and the resources and the motivation to cause some serious damage. Uh, according to the U.S. Uh, Attorney General uh, Merrick Garland, the Department of Justice is sparing no resource to bring ransomware perps to justice. But it would probably be a bit easier if Russia would help by extraditing suspects. <laughs> also, a spokesperson for the U.S. White House National Security Council commented that, broadly speaking, we're undertaking a whole, uh, a whole of government ransomware effort, including uh, disruption of ransomware, uh, infrastructure and actors, working with the private sector to modernize our defenses, and building an international coalition to hold countries who harbor ransom actors accountable. 
Well, the U.S. Treasury Department has levied sanctions against Russia, Russian-owned crypto exchanges, as well as other countries whose shady exchanges are associated with ransom payments. This is a, an overall effort to shore up security of legitimate exchanges and push out the shady ones used for crime. In fact, they also wanted to put out the idea that payment for ransom is unlawful, uh, but not entirely illegal. Uh, there can be fines placed against an organization who does pay, but it seems like the overall goal here is to ready everyone for ransomware attacks rather than make it more difficult to recover from one. I just want to real quick step on uh, talking about exploits of 2021. There was a lot of them and they're important to know about. Um, it's why we're getting infected, really. Google Chrome has had 15 different zero-day exploits in 2021, up from eight that were found in 2020. Google has pushed out patches for all these exploits, but you can imagine that not everyone is going to update soon enough. So it's not unexpected to find out that some of these exploits uh, were observed being used in the wild before some patches were even available. Um, next up, the Kaseya VSA, which is a popular remote management tool for managed service providers, uh, had huge vulnerability in its systems that was discovered in its software, really, that was discovered in late 2020, but not acted on until 2021. The group behind our evil was able to leverage this vulnerability and launch an attack that exploited over 1,500 companies, uh, exploiting ransomware on thousands of systems. You've probably heard about the print nightmare set of vulnerabilities that targeted the Windows print spooler. Using this method of attack, it's possible for a remote attacker to gain full system access while something like this would usually be patched uh, before discussed with being discussed with the public, um, unfortunately, a series of miscommunications led to the release of a proof of concept, uh, like the code of actually how to exploit this vulnerability um, for, for one of Print Nightmare's exploits, but it wasn't the one that a patch was available for yet. So uh, unfortunately, you know, with the best intentions, security researchers made it easier for the bad guys. Finally, at the end of the year, we've been dealing with the log for shell uh, vulnerability, which is found with many Java applications, including Apache servers. The exploit fools an instance of Java running on a server or endpoint to pull down and execute malicious code, which can lead to full system takeover or even worse. And that's something that we're probably gonna be dealing with long into 2022 and beyond. Uh, let's step on uh, malicious emails real quick. What, what have we been seeing as far as threat spreading uh, through email? And it's honestly kind of what we expected. When we take a look at the email threats of the last year, our top two contenders are Drydex, which is a notorious banking Trojan, and TrickBot, uh, which is a notorious everything Trojan. Um, you can see, according to our detection charts for these families, that they have been more active during the second half of the year with spikes in the summer and into the holidays. Uh, that's not entirely unexpected as we see that kind of stuff a lot with the first half of the year often utilized for things like experimentation, uh, you know, research, uh, identifying potential vulnerabilities to attack later, you know, stuff like that. Um, so the Drydex malware is a baking Trojan originally developed to steal online baking credentials from its victims. However, over time, like with much malware, uh, this particular family has evolved to be a loader that downloads various modules that can be used to perform direct malicious behavior, such as installing additional payloads, spreading to other devices, taking screenshots, and more. It's also recently been seen being installed after successful exploitation with that log for shell vulnerability. So there you go. Uh, TrickBot was also originally designed as a baking Trojan, but over the last four to five years, its primary goal has been infection and lateral movement on a corporate network. TrickBot utilizes a toolkit of exploits, network configuration tricks, uh, and trends to bring friends such as uh, Emotet most recently. Uh, and TrickBot is also known to have worked with countries like North Korea in developing their own state-sponsored platforms for attacking networks across the world. Um, in addition to these two powerhouses, we're also seeing lots of remote access Trojans. They really are meant to give attackers uh, remote control of an endpoint after an infection. So it all comes down to control, to gaining access, um, and that's what we primarily see from email threats today. So let's step away from our for a second. We'll talk about fear of fatigue. Um, in our report, Still Enduring from Home for 2021, we discussed fear fatigue, um, and that is basically a, the psychological response to being threatened or feeling pressure over a long period of time. 
Um, this is incredibly relevant to security issues as the constant stream of new attacks, uh, new things to watch out for, new ways to protect yourself, and uh, you know all this other information being out there and it rarely gets any better or any lighter. Um, the fear aligned information we are subjected to on a regular basis really can lead to personal and professional exhaustion or burnout or just overall reduction of uh, performance. So uh, in fact, around 80% of our respondents admitted to feeling fear fatigue at some point recently. Um, and since fear fatigue is brought on by constant bad news, it might just be good to consider taking in your security news in small chunks, spending time thinking about your particular security situation. Um, when it's, it's easy to get wrapped up in hearing about how you know, uh, a government is is doing something to to create some brand new malware that is unstoppable and things like that. But do you really need to fret about state sponsored actors breaking into your work computer if you work for like a coffee shop or something? So put things into context where you can. It's easy to get overwhelmed, but put things into context where you can. Uh, another way to fight fear fatigue is to fight the fear itself. Doing things like ensuring multi-factor authentication on all your accounts backing up important data to encrypted cloud servers, utilizing VPNs and temporary financial accounts, keeping uh, security software up to date, utilizing password managers, keeping applications patched, uh, will all make the individual and the organization more protected against the scary stuff that we tend to talk about. And hopefully that manifests as less fear of the unknown. If you're prepared for it, you don't have to be so worried about it, right? And I'm sure that fear fatigue has been compounded thanks to COVID-19 to our pandemic over the last couple of years to work from home orders and other issues to come with that. So um, it's just something that's out there that we should all be aware of and never forget. So I want to talk about how do you recover from a ransomware attack? This is our, our ransomware recovery plan. It's fantastic. And I'm going to go over it real quickly um, as these are all steps that you should take once you identify that ransomware has uh, shown up on your network. So first of all, you want to contain the attack, you know, isolate infected systems or networks to limit the impact of the attack. Uh, and your priority should be on containing the attack, but if you can do so while also preserving evidence by leaving uh, affected systems turned on, do that. Uh, next, you want to establish the scope of the attack. You know, understand what systems and what kind of data are affected. Prioritize those critical systems for recovery, especially the ones that have the most, you know, critical information to keep things running or the most valuable information that would cause the most you know, harm to the organization if it was lost or uh, published online or something. Um, you wanna communicate with stakeholders. Uh, they may include senior management, PR, your legal team, cyber insurance providers, security vendors, law enforcement, you name it. Uh, make sure you have a list of who you need to call in, in this kind of situation, because the sooner you can get in contact with them and let everybody know what's going on, the sooner everyone can work together and, and help the situation you know, resolve, be resolved sooner. Um, you want to seek assistance, kind of what I was saying. Uh, consider going looking for expert assistance from local and national law enforcement. In fact, a lot it's really good to reach out to law enforcement when you are the victim of a ransomware attack because you can give them information about how you got attacked. They can give you information about, hey, maybe this is what we know about this particular attack actor, you know, the cyber criminal or the cyber crime group. Um, and at the end of the day, that information can go on to help somebody else, you know, to help another organization that may be targeted by this particular ransomware. Um, and even still, if you look at a lot of the takedowns and the arrests that we that I talked about earlier, many were made possible because of the uh, the cooperation of private businesses and private industry with government organizations reporting what they've seen and creating, you know, compiling evidence and creating a case against these people. Um, speaking of which, preserve evidence. You know, with the help of law enforcement and third-party experts, you need to try and preserve evidence for the attack if, if you really can. Um, and identify the ransomware being used. You know, this is going to help you discover if a decryptor is even available. In many cases these days, it's not, but it's good to check. Um, it will also inform the, the specifics of containment, cleanup, recovery, stuff like that. Uh, you want to contain the breach as much as possible. Try to identify systems and accounts uh used in the initial breach and any precursor malware or persistence mechanisms uh, left by the attackers you know that they put something in a startup folder that they put something in current version run is there something that's going to turn back on when you start restart the system 
uh, you want to rebuild the systems. Use known good system images if you've got them, backups to restore critical systems. Take care to segregate clean systems from affected systems. And if you don't already have a clean image somewhere in your corporate network where you can just easily load that up onto a laptop or a system, uh, I highly recommend doing that. Uh, especially and, and keeping it up to date. Don't, you know, make sure there's no malware hidden inside of it or something. Uh, reset, patch, and upgrade, obviously. You want to uh, do all that kind of stuff and instigate any additional security checks necessary to prevent the recurrence of the attack. And then finally, you want to document all the lessons learned. Um, ransomware is constantly evolving. And, and use what you've learned from this attack to prepare for the next one, because it will happen. Ransomware isn't an if anymore. It's more of a when. Uh, and if you can protect yourself, be ready for it, and avoid, you know, um, falling victim, you know, at least avoid being overly damaged by it, then uh, then you're going to be in a lot better place than if you didn't. Uh, and so finally, you know, at Malwarebytes, we've been fighting ransomware since before 2011. So uh, as the ransomware threat grew, so too grew the need for specialized functionality that can more effectively identify and remove ransomware threats. So to that end, Malwarebytes created its own anti-ransomware technology, which basically works by keeping an eye on all active applications uh, and files running on a, a system looking for ransomware specific behavior. And once an application is shown enough to create little to no doubt to the scanner, uh, the application is killed. The file is identified and removed. Uh, we go beyond this by having um, uh, the ability to block exploits with our anti exploit technology, which stops things like malicious office documents from dropping malware like Emotet or TrickBot. Um, we've got the ability to isolate systems very quickly for our corporate customers uh, in case there is, you know, instead of just being able to, to say, run a scan, update, you know, tell me the results, you can actually isolate an infected system from the systems around it for a period and investigate. Um, and we also can admit that no technology is complete without, uh, or completely perfect. And while our anti-ransomware tools detect and remove threats as quickly as they can, it's still possible that files can get encrypted. Uh, but luckily, Malwarebytes has ransomware rollback, which basically takes a 72-hour screenshot of your system files, and we'll be able to restore them in case of a ransomware attack. These are just some of the features that we've directly put a dent in ransomware operations with. Uh, in addition to this, we also have behavioral-based detections for any malicious files, blocking of malicious URLs that might be used to communicate with a command and control server, as well as a lot of other neat features. But let's wrap this up, folks. 2021 saw some serious attacks, many of them exceptionally devastating compared to what we've seen in the past. We're not just seeing attacks against private companies and consumers, but against government organizations, critical infrastructure, and organizations whose breach may cause human death, such as hospitals. Though because of the eagerness and hubris of, that, of those attackers, it's awoken law enforcement agencies across the world to the danger of these groups, which has led to bounties, economic sanctions, and arrests from global uh, with global cooperation. All of these factors make it far more dangerous space to be a cyber criminal, and it has made more groups uh, uneasy, which is good for us. A few hack reforms have actually banned the selling of ransomware on their platforms for fear of law enforcement attention. And despite the fear put into these groups by government intervention, many are ready and willing to shut down operations only to reopen a month later using a different name, a different framework, and likely different affiliates. The money is just too good to walk away from, I guess. So finally, while we've spoken extensively about ransomware, it's also important to know that threats uh, you will likely encounter daily still include things like spyware, crypto miners, uh, but also penetration malware like TrickBot, Drydex, who act like troop carriers more than individual soldiers. If you can keep your security updated and keep your identity secured, you can avoid the majority of these attacks out there. But that's it for us, folks. Thank you so much. Have a great rest of your day.